Welcome to the second day of IMA's inaugural National Leadership Conclave. The theme of the inaugural conclave is from agenda to action, meeting new expectations, an opportunity to examine the challenges to change and to identify ways to turn agenda into action. We are privileged to have a most distinguished lineup of speakers, dignitaries, and a very eminent audience. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be starting the program shortly. And may I request everybody to put their mobile phones on silent mode to avoid distraction to our speakers and to the audience. We also take the opportunity to thank KPMG in India, our knowledge partners, and our associate sponsors, Kevin Kerr, RP Sanjeev Goenka Group, Uflex Limited, Yes Bank, and international partner, Nutshell Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, to start the day, Ladies and gentlemen, we invite on stage the Honorable Minister, Mr. M. Venkaiya Naidu, Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, Urban Development, Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation, Government of India. Ms. Vanita Narayanan, Managing Director, IBM India. We already have with us on stage Dr. Preetha Reddy, Immediate Past President, IMA, and Executive Vice Chairperson, Apollo Hospitals Group and Mr. Sudhir Jalan, Co-Chairman, Writer, India Private Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together and give a warm welcome to the dignitaries on the dais. To start the session, I now invite Ms. Preetha Reddy, Immediate Past President, Aima, and Executive Vice Chairperson, Apollo Hospitals Group, to give her welcome address. Namaste. Sri Venkaya Naidu Garu, Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, Urban Development, Housing and Urban po Poverty Elevation. Ms. Vanita Narayan, Managing Director, IBM India. Sri Sudhir Jalanji, Co-Chairman, Writer India Limited. Distinguished guests, a warm welcome to all of you and a really good morning. It is, as always, a pleasure to welcome you to this special session, a very important session with Sri Venkai Naiduji, the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, Urban Development, Housing. The Honorable Minister, we are honored to have you with us this morning, sir, and thank you very much for agreeing to share your ideas, plans for urban development at the National Leadership Conclave. I completely understand that your time is so precious because we know that Parliament is, is in session and this topic is something which is going to transform our country and hopefully make the rest of the world look at India and its smart cities. A really warm welcome to you, sir. Ms. Vanita Narayan, thank you for coming and agreeing to provide a technology perspective on urbanization and smart cities. I can't thank you enough for your presence, Vanita. Mr. Jalan, as always, a friend. How can I say it's a pleasure to have you because my reason for being associated with IMA is because of him. But a past president, your presence, as always, adds great value to the conclave. Welcome all of you to the session. Though only about a third of the Indian population is urban at present, we can see rapid urbanization all around us and sometimes chaotic urbanization. It is difficult to recognize many spaces, many cities, after a gap of even two to three years. The cities are growing, and the gaps between the urban and rural areas are shrinking. It may be nice if the rural areas look urban. It's a bit worrisome when the urban areas start looking rural, and I think that's probably what the biggest challenge today is. The word smart cities is something which conjures up great ideas in our imagination. Many of us grew up reading comic books and we saw what the futuristic cities look like. Today we had a fantastic session, in fact yesterday, which spoke about how technology is transforming the world, how technology is transforming India, 
how the smartphone users are very soon going to be close to a billion and how they help in business, in life, in governance. Similarly, I think smart cities are really going to transform the way people live in India. Uh, people look forward to good, clean environments. They look forward to great roads, uh, fantastic infrastructure. What you need to do, what you need as uh, allied services, for example, hospitals, schools, uh, etc., in smart cities. And today, with the minister as uh, dynamic, as focused, and as passionate about transforming India, uh, Sri Venkai Naiduji, I think these things are possible. And you know, the future does not look rosy because that would not be the right thing to say. But I would like to say that the future actually looks realistic. And as urbanization is becoming more and more intense, our focus on smart cities uh, parallelly has to be even more intense. Uh, there has been a lot of research done on this. Uh, people want to invest in smart cities. Uh, people want to see how they can actually become better than the old and ancient cities we have. So I think the future is uh, exciting, ladies and gentlemen. And clearly the government's agenda and actions show that it's moving in the right direction. We are pleased to have Professor Solomon Darwin, Executive Director, Center for Corporate Innovation, UC Berkeley, Haas School of Business, USA with us. Uh, welcome, Professor Solomon. He and his students have done a study on smart city development in India, and they want to share their report with the Honorable Minister. Aima has helped Professor Darwin and his team during the Delhi leg of his study. May I request Professor Darwin to come on the dais and hand over the study report on smart cities to the Honorable Minister. Please come. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter Reddy. Uh, dear Honorable Minister, we at University of California, Berkeley, were inspired by the Honorable Prime Minister Modi to, with his vision for smart cities, with the approval of the deans of the Haas School of Business and the School of Engineering. Last year, I have developed a course in building smart cities with open innovation. This included a visit to, by our students to the gift city in Gujarat and to engage with various infrastructure builders, policy makers, and academics in India. It gives me pleasure to place in your hands the final product of a semester-long course by 25 students consisting of frameworks for the three cities approved by President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. Our curriculum will enhance year after year as you make in India a hundred new smart cities. The second book that is also accompanying the package I would like to place in your hand are the frameworks developed by our students for the Silicon Valley cities. This demonstrates the fact that American cities and Silicon Valley cities in particular can learn from the Indian models. Our students at Berkeley have demonstrated that India can lead the world with smart cities, technologies, and frugal innovations that are effective uh, and improve efficiency and reduce waste, energy, pollution, and most importantly, the world's most valuable commodity, time. Smart cities save time so citizens can expend it in personal enjoyment, in relationships, and invest in relationships and creative activities to promote happier citizenry. It gives me pleasure to place in your hand the smart city proposals that were presented to the mayors of the four cities of the Silicon Valley earlier this month. The time has come when the foremost universities, like University of California, Berkeley, the home of Nobel laureates, can learn from India.
Thank you, Professor Darwin, and I'm sure it's, it's really an ex excellent report. It's my pleasure now to invite uh, Ms. Vanita Narayan, Managing Director, IBM, to give us her perspective on smart cities. She has been involved with IBM's telecom practice in Asia Pacific since 2013 and heads the company's India and South Asia operations. A member of the growth and transformation team at IBM, she leads many development and diversity initiatives. Please join us on the dial. Good morning. Thank you, Preeta, for inviting me to be part of this session. And uh, I feel honored, privileged, to be on the panel with Minister Naidu on a topic that's been close to my company's beliefs and heart for a very long time. Uh, we coined the phrase smarter planet almost a decade ago. And, uh, and the smarter cities later were, uh, if you will, a subset of the smarter planet. And, and the reason I mentioned that this morning is uh, we didn't at that point say it was going to be a smart planet. It was going to be a journey. It was going to be a continuous journey because a big part of a smarter planet or a smarter city is about a sustainable model, a sustainable model uh, that is ecological, that is financial, uh, that is based on physical resources that can rejuvenate, and also the human model. So today I'm going to step back because uh, we had this session uh, at AmCham, the American Chamber of Commerce, a couple of days ago, and I asked the audience if uh, anyone could raise their hand who have not been in a smarter city or smart city forum in the last year. And I'll ask you the same. Okay, so we've talked about it a lot. We've heard about it a lot. And I think uh, the need uh, for having, if you will, smart or smarter uh, infrastructure is a given. So today I want to take a slightly different perspective. Uh, Preeta talked about, you know, the, the vision of the futuristic city. That's what someone immediately conjures when we hear the phrase smart city. But I want to step back a little bit. When we look at what really makes a sustainable model, a country, an economy, a community, it's a combination of physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, financial infrastructure coming together with a very strong underpinning of governance and a strategic blueprint. And when you look at the different, let me, and when you look at the different elements, the topic of this particular panel is, can Indian cities become global centers of excellence? The answer is yes. The answer is a resounding yes, not because we hope, not because we will it, but because there is scale at need, need at scale, extraordinary need, and at a very high scale, with some natural resources which are also at scale. So it's now about putting together a framework, a structure, and a model that allows us to make these actually satisfy our demand and at the same time produce capabilities that are not just relevant for India, but for the globe as well. Uh, we know this as, as a company from our experience in India with the telecom industry. We scaled here faster than any of us or our clients could have expected. There was growth and scaling of proportions where we were continuously wrong about the pace of growth. And it is one of the countries where the cost to serve and the average revenue per user is one of the lowest in the world. So that needed a set of innovations, a set of business models coming together with the technology that would allow us to build capabilities and therefore our first global telecom center of excellence was built for our company in India to serve the rest of the world. And it's the same across a variety of different places. So if I pick power, India is the fourth largest producer of wind power, probably the second largest in terms of gigabytes of power, but there are 300 million Indians without access to power. We have one of the highest leakages in terms of energy leakages, so it does require, and the demand and the supply are not going to meet very quickly. The supply side can only expand to the extent 
that is physically possible, which means that we've got to use technologies and policies together to manage the demand side to make that come together. Things like smarter grid, using analytics to ensure that wind farms can be most productive in terms of maintenance, in terms of driving wind energy on days that the winds are going to be at the highest, how we harvest it, how we manage it. Use of analytics, use of smart metering, use of a variety of technologies, both on the generation side, the distribution side, and the operation side, know that we can actually use much more of the energy that we produce by just managing the demand side of the equation while we continue to invest on the supply side. Let's take another area, social infrastructure. Uh, all of us who watched any of the CNN news over the last few days see a level of strife in US cities. Bright cities where the youth is not educated is not a good option. Smarter cities, smarter countries will have a social infrastructure where youth and we have an extraordinary asset in the youth in this country have to be employable. And when you look at the demand side and the supply side on education, and this is an area which is very, very close to my industry because for my industry, education and skills are extraordinarily important to continue to drive the value. We will need, as a country, to educate over 300 million students. If you look at vocational areas over the next decade, 700 million. And we will need at least 1,000 universities and 40,000 colleges over the next decade to meet that need. Is that physically possible? Not really. Which means technology, again, becomes an underpinning for us to look at massive online courses users of capabilities like platforms like Watson that we have, which can actually supplement qualified teachers, where content can come and be disseminated in a manner that's fair, whether you're in rural India or urban India or semi-urban India. Now, the platforms exist, the technology exists, and this is where I think I look to the minister and other parts of the government where we build a digital platform because digital India is central to a smarter India and living in a smart era. If you have a national registry of students and content that can be built, a level of certification that is brought about so that employees and employers alike know what the quality of and the capability of the students are, and a little more flexibility in the model of education, I think this is again an area of private-public partnership that can extend skills in ways, innovative ways, and deliver in ways and nowhere else in the world, I think we have the possibility of the demand side as well as the capability of the supply side because then we don't have borders and you can have professors sitting at the Berkeley School and uh, so, you know, business school, high school, delivering content to students here. Some of that still happens, but not at scale. So the combination of technology with policies and platforms and some level of structure allows us to address the social infrastructure side. Uh, because of the paucity of time, I won't go into health. I know this would have been an area close to Preeta's heart and, and something that probably was addressed yesterday. Again, an area where we have 3.8 million diabetics in the country or 38 million diabetics in the country, 3 million that get care. So when you look at healthcare, another initiative with the Berkeley School, with the Apollo Hospitals and IBM working together on Watson to find ways of providing, rendering healthcare with the use of technology in ways that cannot be delivered in the traditional model. This becomes a model for us, not just for India, and India itself is a tremendous opportunity, but for us to actually solve many other parts of the world, problems and need in many other parts of the world. Last but not the need, uh, the financial infrastructure. We talk about, and I know the minister got this question at one of the other forums, about the funding for smart cities or building of infrastructure. These again have to be, I don't think anybody has major you know, pots of money that can just be allocated. This will have to generate, it will have to self-sustain, and again, this is an area of public-private partnership. When I look at the United States, the United States started issuing municipal bonds over a century ago. One of my colleagues, Kaku, recently and, you know, educated and reminded us, 55% of the US municipal bonds are held by individuals, by households. So there is again a tremendous possibility 
for us with the savings propensity in India that with the government already doing the kinds of things that they're doing with the, the financial inclusion area, with some level of statutory and regulatory support, getting areas like municipal bonds become a, an avenue. And then there are private green bonds for sustainable energy, sustainable water, and different areas, which actually become other feeding mechanisms. Again, can we have tools? When I look at some of the financial inclusion, since my topic really was technology, when we look at the work we're doing with one of our clients, uh, Janalakshmi Financial Services, where it is about credit for the unbanked, the urban unbanked, who are an essential part of the smarter city infrastructure, if you will. We're using things like geospatial, uh, you know, logistical understanding of credit rating. We're looking at analytics with digitization at source using mobile to find ways of taking financial capability to them because most of them cannot leave their stores or their sidewalks alone to come for the financial inclusion in the banks. So as we address the topic of smarter cities, I think it becomes important for us to both continue our interactions with the government during different forums and the policies that they've already gotten started, I think give us a great way to launch the whole initiative that is not just about cities, but really brings rural in. One final example. When we look at India, again, I talked about scale of demand and scale of supply. You have 100 million Indian farmers, you have 10 million retail outlets. And it's about, in the US, the infrastructure, which were the highways, the FMs were built to connect farm to market. Today, India has the opportunity to build our farm to market using both physical as well as digital infrastructures. This again will make us unique and we will do it in a scale that is unprecedented. There are already many opportunities with mobile apps and other, again, as I said, the whole uh, um, reviewing of the supply chain. The recent GST bill is again a huge transformation initiative as well because it will allow companies to revisit how they manage and set up their supply chains. But along with this, if we are able to put in other structural things in combination with the government as they build out the physical infrastructure in some cases, I think it gives us capabilities, whether it's in the area of agro, health, education, energy, technology, to actually build multiple centers of excellence based right here, which both serve our needs, leapfrog us, and allow us to set up solutions at price points that can be unparalleled. So the future is bright, but it requires some level of coordination, planning, and structure, and constant dialogue, and taking these one, one step at a time. Uh, I don't believe that we will all move into shiny cities new. It's greenfield and brownfield, and it's bringing rural and urban together, and our youth, and qualifying them as we make this journey. So thank you for letting me share a few of my thoughts this morning. And thank you all for being a good audience. One great point Vanita made. Um, can we have physical, social, and financial infrastructure? Can Indian cities become global centers of excellence? And she ended by saying that the future looks bright. What more can we ask for this morning? Thank you so much, Vanita. That was extremely illuminating. It's my pleasure to request now the Honorable Minister to deliver the keynote address. Mr. Naidu has a great grasp on the issues of urban, urbanization. And I was just cross-checking with me, but he is a farmer himself, as my father, and two great men who I admire. He does a lot of social work in the rural areas of Andhra Pradesh. He was a Minister of Rural Development in the previous two BJP-led governments. He was one of the architects of the immensely successful Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. Now put in charge of urban development, he is leading the efforts to transform the urbanization process and make Indian cities smarter. A committed reformist, he is taking steps to make it easy to do business in Indian cities by aligning the building laws and rules with the new urban realities. A gifted and great orator and a political activist, since his student days, 
He has been elected to the Rajya Sabha thrice and has also been BJP's national president between 2002 and 2004. It's my privilege to request the Honorable Minister to share his thoughts on urbanization and smart cities with us. Thank you, Pretaji, for a nice introduction. Uh, Sri Sudhir Jalanji, Srimati Vinta Narandi, brothers and sisters. Yes, as uh, Pritaji said, uh, I am a farmer and I feel proud of my background. Gandhiji, after independence, he gave two advices. One, of course, I don't elaborate, it's political. He said, disband Congress. Congress at that time was not a political party. It was a platform of all people who are fighting for independence with common cause. So he said, independence is achieved, disband it. They did not do it, that's a different matter. The second advice he gave is back to villages. But our great leaders, they have shown their back to villages, moved towards towns. Now, urbanization is a reality. You can't reverse it. Even I have migrated from rural development to urban development. <laughs> <laughs> it's destiny. <laughs> my, my heart even today is in village, but my body is in town. <laughs> what can we do? That's the situation today. Because the agriculture is not remunerative. So people are leaving agriculture. A businessman wants his son to be a businessman. A doctor wants his son to be a doctor. An actor wants his son to be an actor even if his face is ugly. A teacher wants his son to be a teacher. Yeah. The, but a tractor running farmer do not want his son to be a farmer. The reason is because the agriculture is becoming unremunerative, vagaries of monsoon, market conditions, policies, fluctuating policies, lack of focus, attention from all the important players in the country. So people are migrating. The, one of the reasons I could understand is there are five E's, education, entertainment, employment, economic opportunities, and enhance the medical facilities. These are the five things that are forcing the people to leave the village and come to towns. All these five are mostly concentrated in urban areas because of our faulty planning in the initial days. Now you can't change it. And who are the people who are living in urban areas? They are also rural people who have come here and will be coming here. They are not coming from heaven. So we have to make urban life more comfortable, livable, the least we can do is livable, and make it more comfortable and uh, useful for the people who are migrating to urban areas. 